Hi, I'm here in DC and I just finished up work on the procession after the inauguration of Joe Biden. So I just played a little tiny part in it, but I got to, you know, see part of the procession and um, I got to work with some new hardware I'd never worked with before. So I mainly just want to talk about a few of the small things that I learned about using an LV1, using it for the first time. And hopefully that will help me remember it. And maybe it'll also help you if you have to use an LV1 tomorrow and you've never used one before. So I think I'll just work from right to left going through these tabs here. So first of all, just in terms of learning how to use this, I've talked about how I learn consoles or any kind of new hardware in the past. Um, the main difference with this one is that I never read the user's manual. And I probably should have, but um, I basically had a day or two to prepare before we got here. And there are so many videos on the Waves site. So if you go to Waves, you'll see that there are lots and lots of training videos for the LV1. And I think I only made it like halfway through. Um, so really great resource and I'm glad those are available. So I'll just, I'm not going to try to teach the LV1 because I definitely don't have enough experience to do that and it's kind of unnecessary to duplicate all of the training from Waves, but I'll just run over um, some of the things that I, I think are maybe confuse me or a little bit more complicated. So first of all, there you can see that for our IO devices, we have four here. So this was the only one that I was next to physically at location one. And to give you some context for what that looked like, it was like this. Um, so there are, uh, there's your servers and there's an IOX and a Galaxy that we ended up not using at my location. Battery backup, uh, Lenovo laptop and another touchscreen here. And as you can see, it's very cold. Um, oh, and so I should say, actually, the most important thing that I learned is I'm so glad that I had this stupid stylus that somebody gave me years ago, and it's just like this cute flashlight, but on the end is a stylus, and I'm so glad I held on to this because it was so cold out there, and if you had your hands out of your gloves for more than a few minutes, you know, they would start to hurt, they would start to go numb, so... I'm really, so I operated the whole show with this. Uh, and then I could also use this on my phone and on the other computer. So make sure you have a stylus if you have to use an LV1 outside, especially if it's going to be cold. Also, it can just help because it's similar to if you've used a Digico and there are just these tiny things that you need to click on. And you'll see a lot of times you end up using your fingernail because they're so small. And so having a pointy stylus... Um, for, for grabbing that stuff can make it easier. Okay, that's actually the most important thing. Um, but I was talking about these inputs. So one, this was at the second location, and then these two were at the third location. But uh, the third location wanted to be the master of all of these. And the third location was doing the recording, so it was the most important thing going on there was the recording. And so the way for that to happen is that location three needed to add each of these um, and be the device manager and then share them with us. And then at location one and two, then we could add them and also use their inputs. So it was kind of, a f it was kind of funny that even though the inputs are right next to us, we are not the managers. Um, so I screwed that up a few times because I would get there in the morning and I would want to go ahead and get my setup tested and test my inputs and outputs. So I would make myself the manager of the device so that then I could, you know, do things with it. But then that would screw things up for everyone else. So then I would have to remove the device. Uh, location three would add it again and or or just become the manager, basically. So um who is the manager is important. Thought it was going to be a struggle to get audio in and out from other computers on the network, but it was so simple. Um, and I actually screwed it up by trying to make it more complicated. I'm used to needing to plan out 
uh, you know, IP addresses and make sure you're on the same gateway. I didn't have to do any of that. I just turned on my computer, DHCP, and it just showed up here. I have the LV1 demo installed on my computer. And as soon as I connected to the network, it showed up here as a network device and I could just add it. And immediately I had IO for smart and recording. Probably the biggest help I can offer here is to set up these user assignable keys. I needed the keyboard a lot, so I made that number one. So I could just, anytime I was renaming something or I wanted to reset uh, an input to zero or some specific amount, pop up on the keyboard, then click on the input. Um, these are sends on fader, store session and save session. This was another thing that confused me. So over in the show panel, um, you can create and update store sessions here. And then if you want to save the file, you click on save, but it, I would like poke at it a bunch of times and it wouldn't turn blue. So it was a lot more satisfying for me to have those user assignable keys set up here. So whenever I wanted to, I could just hit store scene and then save session. So as much as possible, I try to travel light and I try not to bring my audio interface if I can avoid it. So lots of times when you have a setup like this or Dante, and you can just use, you know, get your computer onto the network, then you can get audio IO that way. So I already deleted it, but originally I had um, my signal generator coming in here. So we're on inputs, input A, signal generator would have been here, and I would have been getting that from, you know, input one on my computer. And then uh, heading over to the outputs, I was taking direct outputs then from the signal generator and from uh, my measurement microphone, my 7150. So I have the send, the direct out send output to the computer for smart set to a you know pre-fader just right off of the input. But then I set the signal generator to be post-fader. That way I could control the level I was sending to the speaker um, and the trace wouldn't move up and down in smart. Um, I have a whole other video about um, how to set that up and the explanation for that. So I guess I'll link to that below this video. So here in the mixer window, one thing that took me a while to find is that I wanted to change the color of channel strips to short, sort of like visually see them in groups for myself. And that is here under preset for I was just I kept looking over here and it, I don't know everywhere else, but here um, set channel color. So you choose a color and then you click right, or you click the arrow buttons and that's how you can, you know, just do a bunch of them. Uh, there's a whole bunch of pages for um, custom layers. So if you are familiar with, uh, you know, all custom layers work on in other mixers, it's pretty much the same. You know, if you start on a blank page or something like this, click a drop down menu and then you, you know, you can pick from all these things. Now, one thing that was annoying me for a while is that I would click on a fader just to change the level and it would also offer that I could move the channel. So you can really easy, you can basically click anywhere almost and move this channel strip. Well, I guess anywhere in this area, but I don't wanna do that. So once you get everything set up, then choose lock strips and then you won't be able to do that anymore. This was really the, the money channel. Um, the 417 and the 4098. And I have a picture of that set up here. So here's the 417 inside here. Here's the 498. And um, worked great. Um, this one had a tr more trouble with wind noise for sure, but it was just the backup. Here is one of the X40s that we had set up and, and it was sort of unnecessary, but I wanted to try doing a measurement with Smart. There's my microphone. Here's Smart. Uh, here's the first measurement I took, and I thought, uh-oh, is there a problem? Like, the speaker sounds fine to me, but it, this measurement seems to say that um, I'm missing my low-frequency driver somehow. And then Michael said, oh, maybe there's just too much noise. And I said, oh, let's take a look at the spectrum. So here is the noise floor out there. Uh, in the wind on the street and you can see that yes there's a lot more noise in the low end than there is in the high end so I forgot to store a measurement of the you know with the signal generator on but it was about like this 
So you can imagine that um, it was about like this, and then you know everything below that, there was just too much noise. So that's why it looks like this. And then once I got everything, once I turned up the signal generator a little bit louder, now we have uh, a nice clean trace, or it looks a lot better than it did before. You can see that there's a little reflection here, 2.73 milliseconds, three feet. So could be uh, a floor bounce, um, you know, or off of one of these uh, pieces of staging. And yeah, I don't have anything to say about this. It was just nice to get the measurement and I have a measurement that I've taken indoors very close to an X40 and I could compare that and see, yes, this speaker is working properly. Fantastic. So those are just a few of the things that I learned for using the LV1 for the first time. Um, if you have some tips for me about using the LV1, I'd love to hear it. So please comment on this video. Thanks.